Hello everyone, Brian from Sui Generis Brewing here. It is a cloudy early December day here on the farm and apparently I've been brewing for 25 years. Welcome everyone to my 25th Brewversary video. This is going to be a little different than my 20th. I didn't really prepare much for this. In fact, I kind of had a, an old friend come out of the woodwork and sort of pull this one out of the fire for me. Uh, but this video is, I think, going to be interesting to some of you. For some of you, it might not. Uh, and if, it, if you're finding it a little dull, I'm going to suggest that you click on the chapter marking below where it says surprise, because that really is kind of the, the highlight of the video and the part that I think you might find interesting. What I'm going to do in this video is tell you essentially the story of the first wild beer I ever brewed. As I'm sure most of you know, brewing with wild yeast, uh, sour fermentation, mixed fermentation is something I'm quite interested in and something I, I, I do a lot of videos and blog posts on. And so it kind of suits that for my 25th anniversary, I'm going to tell you all about the many, many mistakes I made on my very first ever wild brew. And yet, despite all of those mistakes, somehow it still turned out. Now we have to rewind back to 1998, so I'd only been home brewing for about two years at this point in time, and that's when I brewed my first wild ale. Myself and a friend that I used to brew with quite a lot uh, learned about these just sort of reading around, and there wasn't a lot of information on them in those days. Certainly not the kind of information we have available to us now. And we looked around and tried to find information on how to brew these things. Now it isn't like today where we have all of these excellent sources things like Milk the Funk and their wiki, or things like uh, Jeff Sparrow's Wild Brews, which is a, a fantastic book, or American Sour Brews by Tonsmeyer. Both of these are fantastic books, lots of information on brewing, and it's a nice sort of supplement to what we have available to us online. Back in the mid 90s, the resources were a little bit less. Online, there were really two sources of information in those days. One was something called a news group called rec.craft.brewing, where essentially you could send an email to a central server that people could see and reply to. And the other one was something called the Homebrew Digest, which was similar in that you would send an email to a server, but in that case, the server would sort of compile all the emails from the day together and send it out as a single digest that people could then reply to. When you went to those two groups, you always got the same advice back. About half the people would say, you simply can't brew sour beer at home. And the other half would say, well, you can brew sour beer at home, but don't ever expect to be able to brew a clean beer again because those sour beer organisms will contaminate everything. And obviously we know today that both of those pieces of ice were dead wrong. The other source of good information in those days were these two books here. Uh, these are The New Complete Joy of Home Brewing and The Home Brewer's Companion by Charles Papazian probably two of the most important books in home brewing history. I don't think there's too many people of sort of my generation of brewers who didn't cut their teeth uh, on these books. But these books tell us next to nothing actually about sour beers. There is some discussion of Lambic and other style of uh, Belgian uh, wild ales. There isn't really recipes for them and the recipes that they do have in there wouldn't be sour. They are just with yeast and fruit and in some cases Britannomyces for a bit of funk. So we really had very little information except for one exception. And unfortunately most of this information is lost to us but I did find one web page stored on uh, the Wayback Machine and it was by this guy named Raj Apta or Apte who was an engineer who was very interested in wild brewing and who made a fair amount of effort to work out a lot of the things we could do at home to sort of mimic what would happen in a Belgian uh, wild ale brewery. Now I, I can't say enough about his pages and it's really unfortunate that a lot of them are lost to us, but it's kind of funny because by today's standards, a lot of the things that Raj came up with were probably wrong. They were mistakes or things that we wouldn't normally recommend you do. We made all the mistakes when we made our first beer and it actually worked really quite well. So the first thing that we found when we were trying to research this beer was that mashing was going to be a problem. In those days people didn't think you could do a proper turbine mash at home. Again that's something we know is completely incorrect. 
Uh, in fact, turbid mashing is an enjoyable way to spend a day if you have a whole day to dedicate to brewing. So one of the first things that we had to do, of course, was decide on a grain bill. And this is the one part that actually isn't too hard to do because, well, recipes are what recipes are. So for our case, it was about 70% pills, 30% unmalted wheat, and I think we used flake wheat if I remember correctly. And we aimed for a starting gravity of around 1065. So we'd have about a 6.5 to 7% ABV beer when everything was said and done. We mashed hot to try and keep our wort dextrinous. And to the boil, we actually added a small amount of flour, which was a mistake, but it was a common practice in those days. I don't think it actually does anything because I'm pretty sure most of that just settles out before anything has a chance to eat it. But the concept was as you were adding starches that would gelatinize in the boil so they'd be accessible to microorganisms, which would then consume them during the fermentation. The next thing we needed was a source of aged hops, which in retrospect was probably all the hops we were using in those days, but we couldn't find proper aged hops. But again, there was a little trick or a mistake, I think we would say today, of how to deal with that. And that's actually that you heat the hops just below the boiling temperature in your oven. And that basically oxidizes everything in them, much like the hops would oxidize if you were aging them conventionally. And you use those in your beer. Now, today, of course, we just age our hops. It does give you a superior product, but I will admit that from time to time, when I run low on aged hops, I actually still use that oven trick and it works okay. It's not exactly the same, but it's better than trying to use fresh hops at a very low level. Uh, you don't get the same flavor from fresh hops at a low dose as you do with uh, aged hops at a higher dose rate. So we mashed our beer, we brought it to a boil, added the aged hops, added the flour, and once the end of the boil, we did what the Belgians did. We, well, we didn't have a cool ship. We just left the kettle out in the backyard, uncovered in the hopes that something good would fall into it. Now, the thing I think should mention here is it was early December. Uh, I was living in a part in Canada in those days, which was notorious for having shorts weather one day and then being minus 35 Celsius. Uh, I'll put the conversion up on the screen, uh, the next. And so guess what happened that night? Yeah, we went from a day, actually not unlike today, just above freezing, to minus 35. And had we been a little smarter, we probably would have checked the forecast before we brewed, but uh, we were young and uh, enthusiastic, and we didn't. And so when we came out the next morning, saw the kind of, it was kind of cool. I wish I had a digital camera back in those days, so I could have got a picture, but we had crystal clear ice that froze the whole way around the outside of the pot and on the top and on the bottom and suspended in the middle was a bubble of basically concentrated wort. So we didn't really know what to do with that. So we just brought it inside, put it on the stove at a low temperature. It melted over the course of a couple hours, at which point we siphoned it into a carboy. We then capped that with foil rather than with an airlock. And we actually forgot about it for three or four weeks. So we don't really know when fermentation started, but we do know that when we went down and checked on it about three weeks in, that it was fermenting pretty vigorously. So that fermentation, it lasted close to a month before it really started to slow down, at which point we made our next mistake. And before I tell you this one, this is a legitimate mistake. Please don't ever do this. This was a idea from the 90s that kind of worked but it's a bad idea. The goal of this idea or this mistake was to mimic the amount of air ingress and air exposure that you would have in a fodder but in a carboy. And again Raj Alpta did this work, kind of did all the calculations and figured it out and I actually still have this here. There was a very specific chair leg that you could buy at the hardware store. It's a replacement leg I think for a couch. And it turns out the diameter of this perfectly fits into the neck of a carboy. And the mount of this that would then stick down into your beer gave about the same wood contact area to volume of liquid that you would have in a large fodder. Raj also worked out that the air ingress permeating through the wood would be very, very similar to what you would have again from a fodder into an equivalent volume of beer. So this was sort of the magic trick, at least everyone thought it was. And it actually did work the first time we tried it, in, in the sense that we got a decent beer out of it. But I'll tell you what happened the second time we tried this. The second time we tried this, the wood swelled up a little bit and it cracked the neck of the carboy. 
and still undeterred, we tried it a third time after we transferred that beer into a new carboy, and that time it plugged so tightly that the carboy actually detonated and we had to pull fragments of glass out of the wall. So as interesting as the technique as this sounds, just don't do it. It really is not safe. Actually, I converted this, you can see here, into a, a tap handle for my, my keyser system, sort of as a memorial. Uh, obviously, it wasn't varnished when we were using it for beer. I varnished it for a tap panel, but that is what we did. And for the first time we tried it, it worked quite well. But for the second time we tried it, it failed miserably. And the third time it failed disastrously. So don't do that. So we waited about nine months for the beer to finish, which again was a mistake. We now know you need at least a year, preferably more like 18 months for these beers to mature properly. We didn't check our gravity to see if it was stable. We didn't do any of those sort of safety things that you would normally do to ensure that things were ready to go. Uh, and we packaged the beer. And again, just out of dumb luck, things went fine. It carbonated to the right level. We had no bottle bombs or any issues like that, uh, but purely luck. Uh, again, before you package sour beer, you should always make sure your gravity is stable over two to three weeks before uh, packaging. So anyways, we packaged this thing. We gave it a few weeks to carbonate and we thought we would give it a try. And I'm sure my memory has become fonder over the years and probably isn't totally accurate, but I do remember we were both very, very happy and excited and impressed and intrigued by what we had made, which is why we immediately turned around and tried brewing more of these. For someone who had never had uh, this style of beer before, it was you know, something unlike we'd ever experienced. The flavors were unique. It was pretty good, well-balanced. I don't remember there being a lot of funk. I remember it being kind of tart with sort of a, a wild, earthy, yeasty flavor, sort of like a Saison. Uh, but it was really good. We really liked it and we started brewing them a little more avidly after that. And that was basically the first wild beer we ever made or I ever made. And it was, you know, a handful of mistakes in hindsight and yet somehow still turned out uh, pretty good. So you might wonder why I chose to ramble on about this uh, as part of this video. Why didn't I do something else? Well, part of it's the pandemic. I really just ran out of time and couldn't come up with anything better. But the second part of it was that friend I used to brew with had tracked me down in June and sent me a package. I actually sent a package to my work. And what the sort of story behind this package is, is the house where we brewed this beer, they, him and his fiance used to rent. Uh, after they got married, they actually bought the house from their uh, landlord and they raised their family there. And it's now, you know, 23 years later, their kids have left and they're finally moving. And as he was going through the attic, guess what he found? Found four bottles of that original wild beer. Unbelievable. I mean, what are the chances of something like that being found? So he sent me two. Uh, and so today I'm going to open this one uh, live on camera and we'll see how things have turned out over the years. Uh, the other one had a little more sediment in the bottom. So I'm actually going to sort of use all of my microbiology skills and see if there isn't something viable in there that I can recover. Uh, and of course, if I get something out of that, obviously we're going to have to try brewing a beer with it. So let's see what we got here. So I'll hold this up by my mic. I really doubt there's any carbonation, but let's see. Actually a little tiny bit there, not really what I would have you know, expected of a fully carbonated beer, but certainly more than I think we had any right to expect. Although that said, maybe that was just a little bit of pressure in the headspace because we're not really seeing any foam there. Now, the first thing I have to say about this is why is it clear? <laughs> um, I don't know about you guys, but I know one of the first things that happen to my beers when, when they get over oxidized is they go cloudy. And I mean, this thing is, is completely transparent. It's probably one of the clearest beers I've ever made. Uh, the other thing about it though, is the color is not right. Um, I would say half the color is missing. Uh, it was more of a golden color ale. And I don't know how well this is showing up on camera, but it's, it's a little gray. There's a bit of a, a touch of gray to it. And I don't think it's the gray sky. I think it's legitimately the beer, but still not at all what I was expecting. Now, let's take a sniff of this. <laughs> yeah, so aromas obviously don't translate on YouTube. It doesn't smell good, uh, but it 
doesn't smell wrong either. It actually doesn't really smell like anything. Uh, it's a little musty, kind of maybe like a, an old closet that's been closed for a while. And that's really it. There's nothing else there in the, in the scent. All right, well, <laughs> I guess we should try to drink it now and see what happens. Okay, that's weird. Ugh. Yeah, so what it has in aroma is what it has in flavor. It tastes like a glass of water that has been left out overnight and then you accidentally take a sip of it the next morning. It's pretty bland. There's a little bit of sourness. It's not as sour as I remember it being. I don't know if lactic acid maybe breaks down over time. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's something. It's not something good, <laughs> probably not too surprising. I thought this was going to be an oxidized, almost impossible to drink, just horribly astringent, you know, vegetal mess. And instead it's, it's just bland. There's nothing left. I, it's almost like all the flavors kind of oxidized out and settled to the bottom of that bottle. And again, I don't know if you can see this bottle, but there's like a layer of wallpaper paste on the bottom. Um, which presumably is everything that should have tasted like something inside of this beer. All right, well, there you are, 23-year-old sour beer. Clearly, I did not package it the way a proper sour beer brewer would, or else it probably would have been a little bit better than that. We'll uh, give it to the fish. And I'm not going to waste too much more of your time, but to kind of wrap up this video, this is a bottle of the beer that I brewed for my 20th Brewversary uh, celebration. So it's 20% alcohol by volume, Belgian Dark Strong. And I gotta tell you, unlike the beer I just had, this thing has aged beautifully. I should probably put up a blog post about it because it's something else. Uh, obviously it doesn't have much head retention. And I don't think this one's very carbonated, but this beer is actually good. So with that, thanks for watching this video and listening to me ramble on. And here's to another 25 years. Thank <laughs> you.